This Monday, the world's most influential leaders in politics and business will convene in Davos, Switzerland, for the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. This year's theme is Rebuilding Trust. Over 100 governments, major international organizations, business leaders, youth activists, social entrepreneurs and the media are expected to attend. Every year, to coincide with the start of the World Economic Forum, the British charity Oxfam releases a report on inequality, which always goes viral. Last year, the big headline was that the top 1% own almost half of the world's wealth, while the poorest half of the world own just 0.75% of it. The report is designed to grab your attention, and it does that very well. But the statistics that they use are deeply flawed, as has been pointed out for years by journalists like Felix Salmon, Ezra Klein, Chris Giles, and many more. If you look closely at the charts that Oxfam provide, which are based on Credit Suisse data, you'll notice that the bottom 10% of the global wealth distribution contains a surprising number of North Americans and Europeans, and that the next 10% contains hardly any. On top of that, China appears to have no people whatsoever in the bottom 10%, and the vast majority of Chinese people are in the top half of the global wealth distribution. So what exactly is going on? How can so many of the poorest of the poor come from the United States, a rich country? Well, the net worth calculation used in this data is assets minus debts, and Americans and Europeans are the most likely people to be in debt, with mortgages, student debt, and credit card loans. But just because someone has debt doesn't mean that they're suffering from the same economic hardship as someone with no debt in one of the least developed countries in the world. An American medical student might graduate university with a large negative net worth, but they will soon start earning a high income and will not be living in poverty for long. I did a Google search for the most indebted person in the world and found that it's Jerome Curviel, the French rogue trader, who still owes $6.3 billion to his former employer. According to Wikipedia, Curviel, the world's poorest man, works as a computer security consultant today. Apparently in 2014 he made a pilgrimage on foot to Italy to meet with the Pope to discuss the problems of modern capitalism. The financial criminal Jordan Belford owes $100 million in restitution to his former clients, but he seems to be doing just fine too. You know me, I'm, I'm a wealthy person, right? Thank God for that, all right? And I wear really expensive watches. 2024 is the biggest election year in world history, with elections being held in more than 50 countries around the world. Eight of the 10 most populous countries are holding elections this year, so about half of the adult population of the globe will have the opportunity to vote. The issue of economic inequality and how to tackle it is likely to be a central issue in many of these elections, so it might be worthwhile digging into the data to try and understand it better. So let's start with global numbers. If you as an individual earn more than $60,000 a year after taxes, you are in the top 1% of highest incomes globally. If you have a household after tax income of $130,000 per year or greater, you are also in the top 1%. According to my YouTube channel analytics, 70% of my viewers are in the top 1%. So well done. According to Statista, the majority of people in the top 1% globally are Americans, and there are around as many 1%ers in the United States as there are in the next nine countries combined. 
top 1% income varies significantly by country. According to the US Census Bureau, real median household income in the United States was just under $75,000. To be in the top 1% of earners in the United States, you had to earn just under half a million dollars a year. Now, obviously, the top 1% includes a very wide range of people, everything from someone who earns 500000 a year to Jeff Bezos, who makes more than that per hour. According to Bloomberg data, to be in the top 1% in India, you had to earn over $77,000. In Australia and the UK, you had to earn over $250,000. And in the United Arab Emirates, the top 1% earn over $922,000 per year. There is, of course, a difference between income and wealth, so we need to cover that. And there is a lot of data on how people earn top 1% incomes, where they live and how they live. There are lots of controversies, too, around how data on wealth and inequality are calculated, which we'll get to shortly. Finance can, of course, become quite intertwined with politics, especially on topics like wealth inequality and taxation. So I was lucky to have a subscription to Ground News, today's video sponsor, to aid in keeping a balanced perspective. It's a website and app that shows you news coverage from across the world and political spectrum, providing a data-driven breakdown of each story so you can cut through sensational language and come to your own independent conclusions. For example, ahead of California Governor Gavin Newsom's recent budget presentation, the Wall Street Journal published an article with his photo saying Democrats want to tax the wealthy to fill the state's $68 billion budget hole. This led to Newsom calling them out, denying their allegations. Using Ground News, I was able to see all sides and learn more about the facts of the proposed California wealth tax, including the press release from the governor and how different publications chose to report on it. Getting your news from only one source can lead to a skewed perspective, which is why Ground News was designed to provide you with all of the available information, like a news source's political bias, ownership and reliability, based on independent news monitoring organisations. I think it's an important service and feel more confident sharing factual information with my viewers because of Ground News. Go to ground.news forward slash Patrick Boyle or click my link in the description to get 30% off the unlimited access Vantage subscription, the plan that I use, to provide you informational breakdowns on the economy. So now that we've covered income, what about wealth or net worth? Well, to be in the top 1% in terms of net worth globally, you need to have a net worth of a million dollars or more, approximately. Of course, once again, that data varies significantly from country to country. According to Knight Frank, the top 1% of Americans have a net worth of $5 million or more. In Singapore, France, Hong Kong and the UK, the top 1% have a net worth of $3.5 million or more. In China, to be in the top 1%, you need a net worth of close to a million dollars. In India, you need $175,000 or more. And at the very top, there's Monaco, where you need to have an income of over $12 million to be in the top 1%. At the bottom is Kenya, where you need a net worth of over $20,000 to be in the top 1%. I've been thinking for quite some time about moving to Zimbabwe as I have this $100 trillion note that I bought on eBay a few years ago. I imagine it would allow me to live like a king. Oh, hold on. It seems it's only worth about $3. But I think I, I only paid $0.40 cents for it, so I'm up nicely on my foreign exchange speculation. But uh, I might have to stay here for, for now.
A lot of the big discussions around the differences between the 1% and the 99% came from the Occupy Wall Street movement, which occurred in the wake of the global financial crisis. There's been a lot of discussion on how the 1% make their money, their political opinions and their lifestyles. A 2021 paper from the CSEF makes the point that for the purposes of analysis, the top 5% might be a more useful cutoff than the top 1%, as a lot of the data on narrowly defined groups like the top 1% or even the top 0.1% tends to have problems and may not be very accurate. I've looked at data from the Federal Reserve, the Tax Policy Center, Census data and the Congressional Budget Office in making this video, and often the numbers reported don't align very well well at all. A lot of the academic research on this topic uses tax data and survey data, both of which have flaws. But the CSEF paper highlights that when you zoom out to 5% from 1%, the different sources start to align a lot better. Some of the discrepancies between the various data sources relate to changes in tax laws, movement of retirement accounts and things like that, which mean that data on the top 1% is more flawed than data on the top 5%. We'll get into some of those controversies near the end of the video. Hopefully you can see that inequality research is a complicated field which is often extremely politicized, and you should take any research on the topic, including the information in this video, with a pinch of salt, as the data can be and often is twisted by people who are agitating for a political agenda, both on the right and on the left. A New York Times article from 2012 described the 1% as being a far more varied group than the Wall Street bosses that many people imagined at the peak of the Occupy movement. According to the author's research, the top 1% were nearly twice as likely to be married as the general population and have more children than middle and upper middle class families do. A vast majority of one percenters graduated from college, and in 27% of couples, both partners have advanced degrees. Doctors, according to the article, are more likely than any other profession in America to be in the top 1%. In top 1% married households, men were found to be earning 75% of the money, which stands in contrast to the population in general, as today in almost half of US households, women are now out earning or earning very similar incomes to their husbands. In marriages where women earn more than their husbands, Pew Research found that women earn a median of $88,000 to their husband's $35,000, out-earning them by $53,000 a year. Richard Reeves on the Big Think YouTube channel pointed out how different male performance is at the different ends of the income spectrum. I think one of the challenges with this debate is that if you're talking to women and men who are, say, at the top of the economic ladder, four-year college degrees, decent incomes. They look around and they don't see some of these issues. But that's not the same for working class men. That's not the same for men lower down the economic ladder. So there's a danger that we're so busy, to borrow Sheryl Sandberg's phrase, so busy leaning in that we don't look down. The reality for men further down the ladder is very different. The 1% were found by the New York Times to be three times more likely than the 99% to work more than 50 hours per week, and were also more likely than average to be self-employed. Twice as many 1%ers as 99%ers were reported to have some inherited money. The affluent families in Nassau County, New York, interviewed in the article, were reported to describe themselves as being practically middle class, saying that property values and taxes in Nassau County are so high that their incomes don't go very far. Overall, the 1% are more likely than average to live in parts of the country with a higher cost of living, and that's often where highly paid jobs exist, and thus their high incomes are often offset by high expenses. 
So what about politics then? Well, according to a Gallup poll, one third of the nation's 1% identify themselves as Republican, 41% as independents, and 26% as Democrats. The poll found very little difference between the political views of the 1% and the population in general, other than being slightly more likely to be Republican. A paper by Oliver Dink on the socio-demographic and job characteristics of the top 1% earners in Europe found that high earners in Europe tend to be predominantly male, aged between 40 and 59 years old, and have a university education. Much like in the United States, health professionals make up a large group of top earners in several European countries. Health professionals were found to exceed the number of business and finance professionals among the top 1% in Finland, France, Italy, Portugal, Sweden and the United Kingdom. The top 1% of earners were found to work in industries like finance, IT, and in senior management positions like chief executives. They were found to have, on average, stayed three years longer with their current firm than lower paid workers had. Denk found that in Eastern European countries, the 1% turned out to be younger than in the rest of Europe, being mostly made up of people who came of age after the fall of communism. Bonuses were found to make up one-fifth of the labour income of top earners on average, and are a particularly common method of pay in places like the UK and Luxembourg. Denk found that the 1% of highest paid employees nearly all work full time and have a permanent contract in each of the 18 countries analysed. They were more likely than average to work at large firms that employ more than 250 people. OK, so what about the spending habits of the 1%? Well, according to research from Charles Schwab, the top 1% spend a higher percentage of their income on education than the middle class do. This includes university fees, private schools for their children and tutoring. The 1% are more likely to be married and have children than the rest of the population. They're also more likely to be homeowners. To many people, the idea of being a high earner brings to mind visions of designer goods and exotic cars. But analysis of the most commonly owned cars in the wealthiest zip codes in the United States shows that the top 1% often own Jeeps, Mercedes E-classes and Toyota Priuses. I was surprised when researching last week's video to learn that the average price of a new car sold in the United States last year was $48,000. Many of the cars bought by the top 1% were at or below that price point. So how do the top 1% invest? Well, according to Knight Frank, 32% of the wealth of high net worth individuals is tied up in their homes. That can be both main residence and holiday homes. After that, they invest in equities, commercial property, bonds, and then things like private equity and venture capital. It's worth pointing out that the top 1%, at least in the United States, is a constantly changing group. It's easy to think that once a person is a high earner that they'll always be a high earner, but according to a study by Rank and Herschel, 11% of Americans will at some point in their lifetime spend at least one year in the top 1% of income earners in the nation, and just under 6% will be in it for two years or more. The study shows that very few get to stay in these high income brackets for their whole careers. Only 0.6% get to earn top 1% incomes for 10 years or more. The fact that people move in and out of the 1% quite a lot most likely relates to the fact that many of the roles that are really highly paid can also be quite volatile. If you're doing well, you're paid well, but if you fail to perform, you could lose your job. Some of this ties back to Oliver Deng's research showing that bonuses can feature heavily in the income of the top 1%. There might be a lesson here that if things are going really well for you, it might make sense to set aside a good chunk of your income in savings as you don't know when the good times might end. 
According to Rankin Herschel, 70% of the working population in the United States will experience at least one year in the top 20% of income earners, and just over half will have at least one year among the top 10%. The study found that those who were already upper middle class and educated were most likely to make it into the higher income categories than those who were at the very bottom. Rank and Herschel also point out that it's quite common for Americans to spend some time at the bottom of the income distribution too. According to their research, over half of Americans will be in or near poverty for at least one year of their life by their 60th birthday. So next up, is inequality getting worse over time? Well, once again, that's a complicated question. I was reading an Economist article earlier this week about Cardi B and the price of lettuce, as I like to keep up to date on the goings-on in the world of rap music. I was quite saddened when they drifted into a discussion on hourly wages and inflation, but that's also what always seems to happen on this channel when I try to make a video about rap music. Anyhow, in the Economist piece on Cardi B, they highlight the fact that hourly wages are today, on average, about 15% higher than they were pre-pandemic, the biggest increase over any three-year period since the early 1980s. If you adjust for inflation using CPI, most of the gains in hourly wages since 1970 are wiped out by inflation, but if you adjust for inflation using PCE, which assumes that if the price of a good goes up too much, like the price of lettuce that Cardi B highlighted, consumers will switch to buying a more affordable vegetable. Adjusting for inflation using substitute goods shows that hourly wage earners are making about 25% more today than they were in 1970 after inflation. It's not just hourly wages that have been rising over the last few years either. Joe Ellison in the FT wrote a piece yesterday about how tipped workers have been doing a lot better since the emergence of the new payment terminals that you see at coffee shops and takeout food restaurants today that suggest a tip. Apparently, tips in bakeries and cafes have risen 41%, while theatre box office staff have seen an increase of 160%. The Economist piece points out that incomes for the highest earners have grown much faster than for the lowest paid, but that taxation and means-tested transfers have balanced out some of that difference. The lowest quintile of income earners in the United States have apparently seen their tax bills shrink over the 40-year period studied, while also receiving more benefits, especially health insurance. Medicaid in America, which covers some medical costs, is America's largest and fastest growing transfer program. Because of tax changes and transfers, income growth for the lowest quintile in the United States since 1979 amounts to 94%. The article points out that post-pandemic pay growth was mostly brought about by an extremely tight labour market and that this may reverse in the event of a recession. It additionally points out that while the richest and poorest Americans are seeing their incomes grow, this is not happening for middle-income Americans. The Economist piece highlights a reasonable amount of income mobility in the United States too, saying that the children of low-income earners, often from immigrant families, often grow up to be high-income earners. They point out that this happens twice as much in Canada, and I'm not sure what might be causing such a large difference between the two countries. There's a really good paper by Branko Milanovic, who is one of the biggest names in inequality research. It's called The Three Eras of Global Inequality, and it analyzes 200 years of history on income and wealth inequality. The paper's really interesting, and I'll link to it in the video description, as due to time constraints, I'll only be able to touch on a few points from it. Milanovic points out that global inequality was more modest at the time of the Industrial Revolution and started growing steadily from that point forward. 
The countries that industrialized fastest benefited the most. This growth in inequality peaked on the eve of World War I. In the interwar period, inequality fell slightly, only to rise again due to the effects of World War II, which benefited rich countries like the United States. After that, global inequality began to fall sharply, mostly driven by rising incomes in Asia. According to Milanovic's research, up until the 1990s, the global income distribution had two peaks. The first peak being the large number of very poor people in the third world, and the second was a much lower peak at relatively high incomes in developed Western economies. The middle of the global income distribution was rather empty. The distribution has since changed, shifting to the right, implying a general increase in global incomes, and this was accompanied by a thickening in the middle of the income distribution, the twin peaks being replaced by a single peak, reflecting what Milanovic describes as the rise of the global median class. This group is much poorer than what is conventionally considered the middle class in advanced Western economies. The growth of this group reflects the rise out of poverty of a number of Asian economies over the period in question and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Interestingly, the most recent 10-year period that runs from the end of the global financial crisis to the outbreak of the pandemic in 2020 has seen a slightly different trend. The most recent growth incidence curve, according to the research, shows a marked deceleration in real income growth for the global top 1%, along with no significant improvement for the people around the 80th to 90th global percentile either. Instead, there's been strong growth in the middle. As I mentioned earlier, income and income inequality research can be controversial. There are lots of different data sources and different conclusions that can be drawn from the same data, depending on how you approach it. One of the stars of the inequality research space is Thomas Piketty, whose book Capital in the 21st Century became a surprise bestseller in the wake of the global financial crisis. His research popularized the idea that the 1% were pulling away from the 99% and benefiting disproportionately in the United States. Piketty's research, it can be argued, formed a foundation for the Occupy movement and their slogan, We Are the 99%. A new analysis by Gerald Auten and David Splinter argues that flaws in the treatment of data by Piketty, Sates, and Zuckman means that while both groups agree that inequality has grown in the United States, Piketty's research exaggerated the extent to which the top 1% have been growing their wealth at the expense of the 99%. Auten and Splinter argue that the poorest half of US society had about the same share of total income in 2020 as they had in 1960, and the growth of the 1% has been much more modest than claimed by Piketty. Some of the flaws that Auten and Splinter point out are quite interesting. They point out that the earlier research included more than 1% of the US population in the 1% because they didn't adjust for the fact that marriage rates are much higher amongst the wealthy than the poor. So dual income households were being compared to single income households. They point out the changes in US tax rules in 1986, which incentivized paying dividends out from companies did not represent an increase in the resources held by the rich, just a change in how those resources showed up in the tax data that was used. Auten and Splinter highlight that Piketty had counted people rolling savings from one pension pot to another as income when the vast majority of untaxed retirement account distributions are just money being moved from one retirement account to another, which happens very frequently in the United States when people change jobs. 
They argued that corporate tax evasion among the self-employed is not concentrated amongst the super rich, that it's as likely at every income level. They back this up by looking at data from IRS audits rather than assuming that underreported income matches that of reported income as Piketty did. Now, this is not to say that Piketty and his team did bad research or were deliberately exaggerating the growth of inequality, as some people have accused them of. It just highlights the difficulty of working with the data they built their research on and how small assumptions can have a big impact. Auten and Splinter don't point out a single big flaw in Piketty, Sates and Zuckman's data, but instead a long list of smaller issues that sum up to a rather large difference in research findings. Piketty has accused Auten and Splinter of being inequality deniers, which I think is unfair. The dispute is really about data analysis and which assumptions and adjustments make sense and which don't. It's likely that this debate will continue between the two teams and over time research methods will improve and more accurate conclusions will be drawn. If you enjoyed today's video, you should watch this one next. Don't forget to check out our sponsor, Ground News, using the link in the video description. Have a great day and talk to you again soon. Bye.